Just how popular were music videos in the 1980s, Ron? I don't know. How popular were they? Apparently popular enough to inspire a, uh, I'm not going to say a forgotten classic, but a movie featuring (laughs) John Cusack and Tom Robbins, or Tim Robbins, excuse me, not the cowgirls get the blues guy. He doesn't show up in this movie. But uh, yeah, so there's a lot of music video inspired mayhem. Uh, You get to see John Cusack play completely against type. And uh, we get to kind of speculate on why certain people we know hold this movie very dear and close to them. Plus, lots and lots of cameos. Lots and lots of cameos. So, uh, yeah, so hope, hope you're ready. Strap in. This is another episode of Anomaly Questionable Movies. And now, get ready for tape heads. everybody this is dan and this is ron and today we're talking about the 1988 movie tape heads featuring john cusack tim robbins junior walker and for a total of maybe 10 seconds uh jessica walter the late <laughs> the great jessica walter so and this menudo. episode and menudo who i don't believe actually show up but you'll have to oh. listen to the rest of the episode to find out and today we find out um what does it take to make it in the music video industry in 1988? Yeah. Um, has Weird Al gone Hollywood? Uh, <laughs> <as> the, <laughs> <He's> sold out. <laughs> you know, do 1980s buddy comedies hold up that well? So mm-hmm. uh, roll the theme song, Ron. Was that it? Oh, okay, let's do the real one. Here we go. Oh, oh take two. No, no, no. I was... Oh, 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 Pausing okay. for a second, oh. <laughs> just if there was a clean break between this and the theme. Oh, cool. All right. All right. So episode proper, take one. All right, we're back. Uh, hopefully, y- y'all enjoyed the theme music. The you real stayed, one. Stayed around. The real or, one, not my ta ta tas. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, and Dan, this is a very special episode. It is. This, yeah, they're all very special episodes. This one's very. This one's personally very special because I have the coronavirus. I have COVID. I have COVID nineteen. Uh, don't know exactly which strain, most likely Omicron, uh, mm-hmm. but is it BA1 or BA2? BA1 was the one that we just had the giant surge of. BA2 is headed our way. Well, it's already starting. It's here. So I'm hoping I have BA2 because BA2 um, can protect. It's still hip. It's, it's, it's the hip one. And it's also, it's new. It's now. It's happening. We'll see. I don't, right. don't want to get it again altogether. I don't want to have it now, but I have it. So there we go. I have COVID. So if you want to speculate on which variant of COVID Ron has, leave it in the comments. We'll <laughs> check them. We'll read them. We'll tally the results. Screw medical science. We're going to decide what Ron's diagnosis is based on your comments, based on this listener poll. Yeah. So let your voice be heard. You and know, don't forget to click democracy. Don't forget to write like a... Uh, you know, hit like if you like, ring the bell as well. Uh, what's the rest of that Anthony Fantano thing? Uh, oh, Dan. Dan. Huh? Dan, I'm worried that I might be crashing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I managed well, to stay awake for all of the movie, and now I might be like feeling the effects. So next week, we're doing Weekend at Bernie's, and I'm going <laughs> to do both sides of it if Ron's asleep. There we go. Um, okay. All right. Or you might need to get it. We might need to get a special guest or something. Well, you know, we'll have to bring in the Jim Henson workshop. Oh, wow. Um, okay. So we'll yeah. have like Kermit and Grover um, um, propping me up? Uh, yeah, and, and you'll have professional ma- marionette work. You know, like it's uh, like after Weekend at Bernie's, I'm kind of surprised the Jim Henson company didn't go into that. Like uh, it's that psychic business, right? Where 
right? Because because like a psychic, they they'll say like, oh yeah, I can let you talk to your dead relatives, right? Right. They're just it's just them doing it. But if you had the full like, there's strings and they're moving around and they're singing and they're dancing, people would pay a lot more for that. Yeah. So Jim Henson, if you're listening, um, rest in peace. <laughs> Well, for now, right? You know, if, if once this technology is patented. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, he'll, be that, he'll be in charge. I mean, the Jim Henson company still exists. Right. We're, waiting for Jim, <laughs> we're waiting for the second coming of Jim Henson. We, we can bring him back. Yeah. We, we want have the, the real technology. Voice. We want the real voice of Kermit back. But so anyways, I have COVID, which means that I'm kind of going in and out of being kind of sleepy. I'm awake for a while. I was awake for all the movie, except for my usual, like, you know, 30 seconds. Mm. Um, and then I crash. So now I'm like half awake. My brain and, fog, I think, is is gone. And wait, can, can I do a save by the bell timeout? Sure. Okay, timeout. So Ron can't hear me right now, but I haven't, I never told Ron this, but every single time he falls asleep during the movie, it's for the best 30 seconds of the movie. Okay, time in. Oh, what did you say? I don't know what you just said. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> but what I do have to say, did you know that when I fall asleep during a movie, it's always during the best 30 seconds? Did so you, you know? knew. You knew this whole time. I, I have. No, you, you, you know when I often fall asleep? It's when there's some sort of like love scene. <laughs> <laughs> I am not kidding. Um, I don't know. It's a little disturbing, but that's what that's what that's when I sleep. Oh man. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, uh, heads. Do you want to describe? Heads, yeah. I don't. I, I don't know what to say. You know, it's like two guys want to get into the music video business, and they try really hard, and it's kind of surreal. And there's a presidential candidate, and um, yeah. Mm. So, and Minuto doesn't actually appear even though they keep promoting Menudo in their big concert. So, okay, that's a really bad, well, I don't know. I don't know if that's a really okay. bad or perfect description of the movie, but you go so, for it. So you got, you got an 80s buddy comedy. The two buddies are John Cusack and Tim Robbins. What are the names in the movie? I can't remember. Yeah, I just saw them written out on screen literally three minutes ago, but it's not that kind of movie. Oh, anyways, one, of them, so, one of them is called Ivan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tim Robbins plays I Ivan Alexiev. Okay. Or something like that. Uh, yeah. He's supposed to be Russian, I guess, but he's Tim Robbins. Yeah, not in the least bit, uh, not in the least bit Russian. But... And so, yeah, so they're working as security guards at the beginning of the movie. John Cusack has a pencil mustache. He's a, he's a sly shyster, but he's like Tim Robbins' agent. Tim Robbins is apparently some kind of music video genius and so they get fired from their uh, night security job because john cusack throws a giant party in the place that they're supposed to be securing and then they go off and become freelance videographers and uh they make a few music videos they do a bunch of like random videography work they film some guy doing his will which we'll get back to the specifics of that scene later in the episode and they meet this woman with a shotgun who's got a free loft and she gives them free rent for their offices and they, they start to get big. And then somehow they end up with the tape of this presidential candidate, like doing some weird sex stuff. Uh, but they don't realize they have the tape. And so these, these like goons in suits are after them for a lot of the movie and they also connect with this like old soul band called the Swanky Modes, which feature the real life Junior Walker, although he's not playing Junior Walker in the movie. Uh, and then they they're like going to throw a big concert and, you know, all the shit hits the fan at the during or during the lead up to the big concert, because this is a movie and that's how movies work. Uh, and and the concert eventually happens and it, it goes fine and they get. Uh, you know, they save themselves from the, the presidential candidate's henchmen. Uh, and it turns out that the, the woman with the shotgun they've been uh, sort of renting but not renting the space from is the daughter of the presidential candidate. And, uh, and then the movie ends. Well, and, and they ruined the presidential candidate's campaign by um, uh, broadcasting uh, a sex tape. Oh, yeah, yeah. They broadcast the sex tape um and 
Yeah, and so there, there's a few commercial parodies, music video parodies throughout the movie. That's probably the the highlight of the movie for me, at least. And uh, probably the best one is this uh, pretty dead on. I think the production values are a little bit higher than like the kind of real life versions of this I've seen. But it's this uh, advertisement for Rock, Roscoe's Fried Chicken. Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles. Yeah, Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles, which this is also, I believe, the earliest mention of chicken and waffles I've seen in a movie. And, and Roscoe's House of Chicken and Waffles is a real place. It's a real place. It chicken. is. Yeah, yeah. I know it's in, 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 in the L.A. area. I don't know if it's, if it's national or not. Okay, so that might be the real Roscoe doing the, the rap. He's doing, like, this classically awful, like, white guy fake run dmc rap throughout the whole commercial that's just amazing with with three backup singers dressed up in mm-hmm. Roscoe's outfits it's great yeah they do two they do they do one early on and then they do one at the uh end credits um yeah i agree that's that's the best part i mean it's great all the all the all the the music video parodies um sort of parodies uh, but that's the best the commercial yeah, there, there's a few really funny lines, like they're getting shot at in the office, and then John Cusack like sticks his head out, and it's like, we'll give you your money back. I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. There's a few, it, it's not a bad comedy, it's like pretty boilerplate as far as like 80s buddy comedies go. Oh, another line I liked uh, was, uh, um, you've seen the best, now see the rest. Oh, great. Right, right. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, and so I... Things. Oh, to say I'm agreeing. There's a few other great lines, but I don't remember them. Yeah, there's there's I I love the part where they think that they can get to do Weird Al Yankovic's music video, and they like ambush him in front of I think the Capitol Records office, uh-huh. and he just like pushes John Cusack onto the sidewalk. Yeah, that that is funny because that's so not a uh, that's that's what's his, that's so not Weird Al. Yeah, Weird He's Al. Like such a nice guy normally, right? Yeah, but you know he he went Hollywood for this movie. Right, 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 right. Um, this is a sellout. And so I I guess the most interesting part of this movie is probably the questionable but potential influence it had on other movies. Oh, interesting. Okay. Right. So we have Weird Al Yankovic in a movie about like two two guys doing like kind of low budget janky video production a year before uhf uh we have a gag involving a dead guy being used like a puppet so that he can talk and do things a year before weekend at bernie's um we have sort of the plot of wayne's world 2 going on a little bit um but I'm, i'm not sure that any of the parts of this that ended up in wayne's world 2 like you couldn't I don't think there's anything in this that you can trace back to some earlier movie. Well, the main thing is the the the, the closest thing is 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 waiting for the what did, what is it called Wayne Stock the uh-huh. yeah having the the concert at the end and um, if you book them they will come yeah so here it's like is you know they're advertising Menudo and um, you know it's not clear that Menudo actually agreed to uh, play the concert and Menudo never shows up. Um, but they get a thank you in the credits anyway yeah 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 uh but um, and like wayne's world 2 is probably a better movie than this on the whole i would say having yeah. seen both of them in the last month yeah i don't know how to categorize this movie but i understand who is who is it that really loves this movie That's uh all- carrie who has been on the show um if you want to check out our patrick mcguin episode oh yes um her and her husband love this movie probably because like it's the kind of movie where if you saw it at the right age it's celebrating a lot of stuff that wasn't necessarily always in like big mainstream movies in the 1980s so it's very much a movie about music culture there's a huge soundtrack listing like the music credits at the end credit sequence or i think most of the credit sequence honestly Uh um you have this kind of irreverent sketch comedy style comedy. Uh, you've got a snobs versus slobs. 
lot, right? Like, you know, every 80s comedy ever, in, including, I mean, Wayne's World wasn't in the 80s, but it has a lot of those 80s tropes. Uh -huh. um, and you got the buddy comedy thing where it's like the one guy is kind of the agent, the other guy is like some kind of supernatural talent, supposedly. Um, you've got a lot of cliches in this movie, but they're sort of being used to accentuate a different part of 80s culture than a lot of those other movies were. Yeah, I mean, so much of it, well, it's, it's I don't know, if it's, it's all sort of a, not quite a parody. I mean, there's a lot of parody in it. Um, there, there's a lot of broad comedy. I, there's yeah. not like the level of self-awareness of like a Wayne's World. Like, I think that's what sets Wayne's World so far apart is that Wayne's World is probably the most self-aware movie I've ever seen. Interesting. Okay. Like every single joke is about the fact they're in a movie practically. Okay. And wait, like... wait, wait. Nope. I've got one. I've got one that'll be okay. hell's a popping. Oh yeah. Okay. Fair enough. All right. But which is a very different kind of movie. Um, Much earlier. Yeah. 1941. Yeah. And if you want to check out our episode on that, uh, it exists. It is on our YouTube channel. It is on our main website, anomaly.com. Um, just look up Anomaly Hell's a Poppin' and it should come right up. And if you want to see something really amazing, uh, search for Hell's a Poppin' um, Lindy Hop because it's oh, yeah. the, one of the best dance sequences in movie history. Um, but anyways, you were... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so I guess what's noteworthy about this movie is this focus on like pirate video culture Um and there are a few like kind of subtle nods to that in the film. So like the reason why the main like their version of MTV is called RVTV uh -huh. is that the way that people would do pirate TV stations in the 80s was basically just setting up all the equipment in the back of an RV and then driving around to get the signal different places oh oh okay. if i had to guess like i you know i've not spoken to the screenwriter or the director or anything but it's there's not a lot of other reasons why they would change it to rv tv yeah yeah okay i was wondering about that because it was like why why you know clearly they're mm -hmm. they're making fun of or not making fun of mtv but they're referencing mtv um okay i didn't i was wondering why they used those letters that that makes sense i'll buy it I'll buy yeah, that there's some dollar. kind of like maybe subliminal references to some of the famous pirate TV incidents of the 80s. Mm. So like when they they accident or they don't accidentally when they broadcast the presidential candidates, I wish they'd made him a senator or something because a, a presidential candidate is just such an awkward fucking thing to have to say every three sentences. <laughs> but like Peace. when they broadcast that out, yeah. It's the closest thing I can think of in TV history is the infamous Max Headroom incident, uh, which you, you, you know about that, right? Yeah, but I guess I should explain it for the tell, tell folks about it. <laughs> Not everybody okay, knows. So there was a football game being broadcast in, I want to say, like the San Diego, it was some, some market in California. Some guy managed to jam the signal and broadcast a video of him in a Max Headroom mask, spanking himself and saying things that are not particularly intelligible. No one has ever figured out who the guy was, uh, although there are videotapes in circulation of the, uh, the broadcast disruption. He's the D.B. Cooper of uh, broadcast disruption. Yeah, if anybody knows who that is, like, Hit us up in the comments because I've been wondering that for years. Because the, the guy's a legend, you know, that's like the biggest broadcast, like pirate broadcast interruption in at least US history that I can think of. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so that happens. I want to say that happened 1986. So that would have been fresh in the public memory at that point. Okay. So, I mean, is this the first movie where somebody like, you know switches out footage for other footage no 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 but the fact that they're broadcasting it on satellite uh on like tv syndication satellites makes it slightly different um and in terms of the earlier thing with with influence 
it resembles the ending of Kevin Smith's Mall Rats quite a bit. In what way? Uh, so at the end of Mall Rats, they're shooting the uh, the TV show. Oh, they're shooting the TV show. Jay and Silent Bob are trying to get a video of Ben Affleck having sex with the woman who it turns out is underage uh, on the video monitors to save Brody, a.k.a. Jason Lee's relationship with that woman that was on 90210. Uh, uh, so, Brenda. Um... Brenda, yeah. So we have like interrupting a, vi- a TV broadcast for far less important reasons um, with a videotape. So I don't know if that was an influence. I could imagine Kevin Smith seeing this movie and loving it. 1988. This seems like the kind of movie that Kevin Smith would have been down for. Oh yeah. Yeah. He probably had the VHS and it was all like scratched up and, and <laughs> by the way, Brenda is Shannon Doherty. That's that's Shannon great. Doherty. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, Shannon Doherty wasn't with Jason Lee. Um, she was with, um, uh, no, she's with Jason Lee because she like goes in in the beginning and she's like, because he's playing NHL 90, 94, I want to say. It is him? Okay, I thought it was, I thought it was the, the, the lead actor. Oh, no, well, whatever. Jeremy, not- Jeremy London is dating the, uh, uh, the um, I mean, I guess they're both like kind of skinny brunettes, but she's like oh, more, she's got lighter brown hair. He's supposed to, his, the, 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 the woman that he's in love with is uh, the woman on the dating show. Um, right because her dad is the bald guy that runs the dating show yeah yeah that gets like the the steak palm or whatever they call it where brody like wipes his wipes his ass and then hands him chocolate covered pretzels yeah 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 but anyways tape heads so yeah so that's that could have been an influence on that um potentially all right but yeah what what is there to say about this movie uh yeah, it was a it was a light and breezy movie. Yeah, yeah and I, I picked it, I think, because like I've been doing a lot of stuff with tapes lately, like more than usual, because I've always been kind of a tape guy. But uh, I just remembered, yeah, like uh, uh, Carrie and my brother in law, when I went to visit them once, they were like, yo, you got to see this movie. This is a classic. Huh. And they had the DVD. I watched it. And I was like, okay, this, this is like an 80s buddy comedy. There's like stuff about kind of 80s alternative culture and MTV and all that. Yeah. Like I could understand why they had this soft spot for that movie because they're a bit older than I am. So they would have been like the perfect age to see this movie when it came out. Right. Um, I'm probably, yeah, I would have seen this was in college. I didn't watch it. And I also wasn't into, uh, I, I didn't watch MTV and stuff. So I, I wouldn't have appreciated it, I don't think. Um, mm. I do now. But I do now in this sort of, I want to say a nostalgic way. Well, actually, here, here's an example. Star Wars. I was never a big Star Wars fan. Um, but when Star Wars The Force Awakens came out, I watched it six times. Not because I thought it was a great movie. I mean, I thought it was a good Star Wars movie, but I was watching it for this nostalgic feeling for a movie that I didn't actually watch when it came out when I was a kid. (laughs) But it was, that was the era I grew up in. So I I saw Return of the Jedi. I saw Return of the Jedi before I saw the other two. And then I saw saw A New Hope like like a few years later. And then I didn't see Empire for like a long time. So, um, but when I saw Return of the Jedi, the friend I went with gave me all the background and explained everything to me and explained about spoilers. Darth Vader is Luke's father. <laughs> um, so he had to explain stuff like that to me. So, But I knew who Yoda was because he mm-hmm. was like in all sorts of stuff. And I remember my, um, this is when I was in Israel, my friend had a little Yoda um, figurine. Um, oh, so. probably one of the Kenner action figures. Yeah, yeah, probably. So um, anyways, I'm sorry. The point was that I was nostalgic for something that I didn't actually experience per se at the time. So this is making me nostalgic for all that MTV and all those MTV videos, MTV videos that I didn't watch when I was uh, when I was a teenager. 
Yeah, and I, I think there's like, I don't know if there's a specific word that somebody's come up with for that yet, but like, I totally have, I, I totally know what you're talking about. I've had that. Mm-hmm. I, like, like, there's a lot of older stuff where I'll see it. Like, I didn't watch a lot of MTV when I was a kid, although MTV was mostly reality shows by that point, and like those yeah. were eating game shows. Um, and yeah, I still like, if I see MTV VHS tapes when I'm out, looking for inventory i always pick them up just because it's it's fun and it's goofy i have one at trl like i literally never watched trl when it was on yeah i think i saw one episode um maybe two yeah and and i think there's like definitely kind of a that i don't want to call it false nostalgia like like spectral nostalgia maybe would be a better term for it spectral nostalgia wow I like that phrase. Okay, we'll call it spectral. spectral nostalgia. You heard it here first. Yeah, let's make uh, it a thing. Hey, yeah. hey, it's an anomaly, or it's a, um, it was an anomaly, now it's a real thing. Here, can you provide us a synth definition for it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think you gave a pretty good definition. Nostalgia for an event that one has not experienced. All right, all right. Uh, or for, for a past event. So it was an anomaly. It was an anomaly. It was a, a concept or idea in search of a word, and you created the word for it or the word phrase. Yeah, and everybody use it. Credit the show. Tell people to like, subscribe, leave a comment. Um, you know what we should do? We're getting pretty show? lonely out here. You know, if you don't comment, then we're just going to presume that you don't like us. Yeah, please comment. I mean, Dad, Dan lives alone. I, I not only live alone, I'm housebound. I'm isolating because I have COVID. I mean, I shouldn't really be getting around anyways, because I'm, you know, you're supposed to rest when you have it, even after it's gone, it's not totally gone. You're supposed to be a couch potato for weeks after, but um, um, yeah, I'm stuck at home. So comment, comment away, please, please. Yeah, <laughs> if, if, if you want to like, if you want to talk movies or bullshit with us, like we do read the comments, we do respond. We are not Weird Al Yankovic. We have not gone Hollywood yet. Yeah. Um, and but but yeah. So hey, did uh, we ever do a shout out to our buddy in Russia? I think we oh. did, but we could do another one. Yeah, let's do another one. Hey, Ru- wait, I can't remember his name. Wait, hold on. Oh, okay. it's, I, it's, it's, I remember his name. Ooh, I could go check. Um, yeah, our buddy yeah, in yeah. Russia. Our buddy our in, buddy Russia, in who Russia who loved small soldiers and played the game and uh, gave us some feedback on the show. When we're doing, talk- buddy. What was that? The old, our Doom buddy. The only other guy who spent his free time playing like 90s Doom mods. Yeah, there we go. Computer yeah. besides, well, no, I, I think there's quite a few people doing that or else there wouldn't be all those websites for it. But yeah. the only one that commented, so the only one that matters, you know, he's like, like if the Clash were the only band that mattered, he's, he's the only guy playing Doom 2 mods that matters. No, he's... He's the only person that commented on an episode that had nothing to do with Oz and other. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that Oz, people love that Oz video. Yeah. Um, although I think it's finally starting to wind down. Oh, that's too bad. The traffic, but. I bet, I bet it'll make a resurgence. Just like COVID, there's going to be another surge. Yeah, because it, it dropped for a little bit and then it like spiked big time and. You know, all I think it's going to take is for some kind of retrospective thing to come out about Oz. People are going to look that up. I I think that one's got long-term potential. But So spectral nostalgia. So I I think we've stumbled on something really important here because I feel like that's one of the defining tones of modern media. Interesting. Wow, that's okay. I see that all the time, right? Like there's, uh, so in the Saved by the Bell reboot, which... Uh, I'm at least mildly obsessed with. I think Ron is kind of in the same boat. Oh, totally, totally. Oh, yeah. I, I, I saw the first episode of it. because I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe that they rebooted Saved by the Bell. What a horrible idea. That show is amazing. Before I even finished watching the first episode, I pinged Dan. I said, you've got to watch this thing. You've got to watch this thing. Oh, no. Right. I, I thought you I were said, watching watch the original this. Saved by the Bell. So I started watching the actual <laughs> like the, the 90s Saved by the Bell pilot. And those are, oh, my God, Dan, I'm those sorry. Those are so bad. But, but yeah, no, was it was good, good though, because it paid off because there's a bunch of like Easter egg kind of jokes in the new one that refer yeah. back to the pilot. 
I'm not going to ruin any of those, but uh, minor, minor spoiler. There's an episode where the son of Zach Morris, he has these motivational tapes to get people to do things and they open his locker in their actual audio cassettes. The target <laughs> audience for this show, I'm guessing it's going to be like, I mean, I'm not sure who the target audience for the show is. Well, this is, it's a show that parodies itself. It's, it does right. an amazing job of being itself and parodying itself um, and parodying the original series all at the same time. So I think in, yeah. so in a lot of sense, I think it's both for, for people who, uh, saw it when it first when the original series when it came out and people who've never seen it younger people who've never seen it so uh yeah it's it and i i think like the show the show that it's much closer in tone and structure to than the original saved by the bell is probably community yeah okay i see that because you've got the kind of like crazy school you've got these like over the top characters from different backgrounds kind of figuring out their shared interests and in coming to uh alliances and whatnot yeah um but and anyway yeah so it, it's cassette tapes maybe that's not a great example okay better example is 13 reasons why that netflix show 13 oh i haven't seen that i i saw a big joel did a video essay on it shout out to big joel out in london or wherever the heck he is um but but it's a show very much aimed at teenagers who by this point would not have existed at a point where audio cassettes were at all relevant. They probably remember them as like things their parents might've had around the house or something. Right. And when, so the basic premise of the show is this, this woman kills herself and then she leaves behind 13 reasons why she leaves them on 13 audio cassettes. She's recording this stuff on a blank audio cassettes. For some reason, all of these teenagers who exist in the year 2017 or whatever, uh, they all have Sony Walkmans that they can play back these cassettes on. You're kidding. Yeah. No, no, I'm not kidding. No, 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 that's, that's, that's for real. I mean, for, for real in the fictional world of 13 Reasons Why. And uh, it's... Uh, or, or like I think a lot of the the reason why like kids responded so for like the, the kid I'm I'm just calling everybody under thirty a kid at this point <laughs> but why like Stranger Things took off so much one yeah like, yeah I was thinking of that that kind of like spectral nostalgia for the eighties and I think part of that has to do with like the decline of U S culture right because um, there there's a lot of stuff that I think was appealing to kids in the 90s because it referenced back to the 60s in a way that they didn't remember but they kind of felt like they could own the memory of it because they weren't there in, in a weird way kind of yeah like it becomes this rorschach plot that you, that you can project your own values onto in the 80s we had all these references to the 50s right, right. like happy days happy days was so popular and it was Anyways, sorry. I... Yeah, and I think like Saved by the Bell, it serves both audiences because like Happy Days, it's throwing that stuff out there to the people who remember the 50s, but then it's also creating like the 50s as this kind of fantastic world elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and everybody of all ages loved the Fonz. Yeah, yeah, everybody loves the Fonz. Um, They'll do. Still the coolest character on TV ever. For sure, yeah. Um, hey. he's, he's the best part about the Mork and Mindy pilot for sure. <laughs> so, well, spectral nostalgia. I mean, do you, do you have any? I mean, you you kind I of brought us to this point with the Star Wars thing. Yeah, the Star Wars, um, MTV, actually, eighties music in general, because I didn't really mm -hmm. listen to uh, popular music. Um, most of the popular music I listened to was actually it, it was um, you know when you're watching a movie and the soundtracks always had like current popular hits or songs written for the movie that then were played on the radio and also my sister had a boom box and she mm. used to play uh play it all the time so i used to hear that so all the madonna uh, uh madonna tiffany debbie gibson um uh what's her name girls just want to have fun how can i not remember oh cindy lopper cindy lopper who by the way i saw on stage in a production of three penny opera um a new translation um, and direct Cindy Lauper uh, doing Kurt Weil. Kurt Weil, what? The, he's the guy who did the Three Penny Opera. No, wasn't that um? Was it Kurt Weil? 
pretty sure that was Kurt Weill. We, we, oh, can, okay. we can double right. check that, but. But she played, what is the name? Jenny the. Wait, I'm going to look this up. Um, but it was directed by Wallace Shawn. Oh, crazy. Yeah, it was adapted and direct or translated and directed by Wallace Shawn. I okay, ran into him as people were, as the audience was leaving, you know, I'm moving kind of slowly and they're just opening and suddenly there's this, there's a short guy in a suit, like walking very fast and everybody's just ignoring him. And I realized that's Wallace Shawn. So as he walks past me and say, Hey, great show. And he turned around and said, thank you. And kept going. <laughs> so, uh, that's great. It was, it was a great show. So, uh, so, so I looked it up. The book is by Bertolt Brecht. Yeah, that's what the, it is. The music is by Kurt Weill. Okay. Okay. I, I re okay. All right. I remembered Bertolt Brecht. I, I, I didn't, I didn't realize it was Kurt Weill. So uh, when, so, so still like two, two things that, that you would not mentally associate with Cindy Lauper. Correct. At least I would not mentally associate with Cindy Lauper until now. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I never, never mentioned it. It was really cool. It was sort of like seeing, um, uh, Luke, um, also from 90210. Uh, who was the guy that died? He was in River Riverdale. Uh, Luke, not Luke Wilson. Um, not the guy that, oh wait, maybe Luke was the character's name? So, so I have a shameful admission to make. What's that? I never actually saw any of 90210. Oh my God, Dan. I've Dan. never seen an episode of Dawson's Creek. Oh, uh, that's okay. I wasn't actually alive during the 90s. Well, wait, when were you born? 1989. I, I was, oh. but I just I missed the zeitgeist. You weren't you were you weren't nascent yet. Well, I, I think I was mostly watching cartoons. Was the thing like the live? I can count on one hand the number of like live action shows that I gave a shit about before I was like ten or twelve. Okay. And they were pretty much all on stations that were mostly playing cartoons. So like I have fine memories of, like my brother and me, which was on Nickelodeon. It was it was these. Uh, it was like. The, I remember that being pretty good. I should see if I can find some episodes of that now. But uh, oh. it was sort of like a proto Keenan and Cal. You have kind of like the um, pretty pretty early like uh, like Nickelodeon. They they actually did a decent job with like doing like putting black sitcoms on TV early on. Hmm. Um, Pete and Pete, salute your shorts. Is that it? You That's all I'm remembering. Yeah. You can't do that on television. Uh, no, that was that was off the air by the time I was. Oh, okay. I don't, I don't remember. I think that was mostly in the eighties. I okay. mean, so there were like some live action games. So, like, I I definitely watched a fair amount of like Legends of the Hidden Temple mm. and like all that, which Keenan and Kel was a spin off of all that. Right. Um. But yeah, yeah. So so we're we're still just talking about the Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon. And the Cartoon Network didn't do any live action stuff back then. So like anything live action I was seeing was on Nickelodeon. And sure. I wasn't into the Disney shows. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that was a that was a different that was a different beast. Yeah. But um <laughs> the guy from 902 and O that I was thinking of Luke was, Perry. It was Luke Perry who played Dylan McKay. And the reason I brought him up is that just like seeing, well, sort of like seeing Cindy Lauper in Three Penny Opera. I saw Luke Perry uh, as Brad in a revival, Broadway revival of the Rocky Horror Show, um, which also had Dick Cavett as the narrator. Oh my God, Dick Cavett? Yeah. With Luke Perry. Oh my, yeah. That is yeah. wild. Yeah. So I, and, I do uh, have Leah, a Leah Delaria that. and Leah Delaria uh, as um, the Meatloaf character. Uh, what's his name? Huh. Uh, Oh yeah, uh, uh, oh, fuck! I can't remember. Papatuti, bless my soul. I really love that rock and roll. Uh oh, are we gonna get uh, copyright ding for that? Uh, we'll we'll have to see. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I just remember. I can't remember the name of the character. I just remember him like bursting in on a motorcycle through the wall in the movie. Right, right, right. Um, geez, well, it's so, so bad with names of movies that, and shows that we're so familiar with. Yeah. I mean, I'm usually and, bad with names, honestly. So. And so I have a piece of Cindy Lauper trivia. Okay, ooh, ooh, let's hear it. Not many people are going to care about, but my grandfather was Cindy Lauper's high school principal. Really? 
Yep. In Long Island. I, I think it was, uh, I forget what the name, he, he also was like, John Gotti's son went there. Uh, who else was there? But yeah, yeah, the, the two people that were he like vaguely knew. I mean, he had like a crazy story. Well, not that crazy a story about like the one time he met John Gotti. Um, oh, I don't know if we should talk about it. I don't want to, you know, you know, incite the mob. Well, yeah, I, I mean, John Gotti them. honestly comes off pretty good in the story. Oh, okay, okay, enough. let's yeah, hear it. So it's, and I mean, this is, I think everybody involved in this is probably dead by now, but yeah, so his son like lost his textbook and the end of the year came and uh, you know, my grandfather was trying to collect the money for, you know, like if you lose the textbook, you got to pay the school for the textbook, right? Yeah. And the kid's are like, you know who my dad is? Fuck you. I'm not giving back the textbook. Uh, and I pretty probably didn't talk like that. But yeah. And then John Fuck Gotti. You. Do you know who my father is? Yeah. He pulls the, you know, I'm you know, not my giving father back the did. textbook. Yeah, that, that's probably closer to, to what he sounded like, I, I think. And and so, yeah, he shows up with John Gotti in the office. And John Gotti is, like, basically carrying the kid by the ear. <laughs> and he's just like, okay, say sorry. Say sorry to Mr. Levine. Here's your 15 bucks. Or whatever it was for a text. <laughs> All right. So, you know, he had his, he had his, he had values. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's sort of when I was watching The Sopranos, it kind of reminded me of like when when Tony's like going after AJ and it's like, why are you doing well in school? What the, you know, right? You know, I remember when um, when I was in college, I remember there was a there was a class that was taught. Um, well, there was one class that showed up and it was about uh, um, how the mafia and um businesses and capitalism they're really operating the same way that there's no difference between them really and i remember at the time thinking like wow what kind of bullshit is this all that and now I'm like yep yeah it's it's really it's not that hugely and, and i think like a theme that comes through a lot of mob movies and like in terms of the point you were just making like that's the entire point of that scene in the second godfather movie where it's like the captains of industry, Michael Corleone and the, the guy from Cuba, and they're just slicing this cake with the map of the world on it. Uh huh. Um, yeah, it's big I, business. Multinational. Yeah, yeah, it's the same. And, and yeah, and like a lot of those movies are about basically just like, okay, if you're the, the mob is just the, the corporation for the people who are excluded from the larger mechanisms of capitalism. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that's a pretty common theme in, in, in rap music too. And that kind of, that's why they're so obsessed with mob movies on a lot of those records. Like, you know, those Wu-Tang Clan records are talking about like Starface and the Godfather, like constantly. Uh -huh. Um, and, uh, Hey Dan, you know how, you know how to tell how, how we can tell that I'm COVID-y that I'm slightly, uh, 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 out of it because of COVID, it's because it's usually my job to say so. Name of movie um, to turn the conversation back, and I have <laughs> been like forty five minutes, and I just realized it, and it's and it's. I think it's fun. Is it time for me to say it? What do you think? I probably yeah. All right, here we go. Get ready. Three, two, two. one. Okay. So tape heads. So yeah. So tape heads like. This is one of those movies where if you like the box, you'll probably like the movie. <laughs> this is exactly whatever is in your head that this movie is. I can't imagine it's that far off from what the movie is. Yeah. If that doesn't sound appealing to you, you're not going to like this movie. It's and not a great movie. It's not a terrible movie. It just exists. Yeah. And we, we were talking like through, throughout the whole time, sometimes relating to the movie and sometimes not. But, you know, I think I think that was just exactly the right amount of attention that uh, that it needed. So I think we enjoyed the movie more because we were talking during it. Yeah, it, it doesn't yeah. presume to have your attention. It seems like I mean, I guess maybe that this is this is a, a I guess there were two things that I kind of wanted to talk about that we haven't gotten to yet. So I'll go with the first one. OK. A lot of these movies in the 80s, as soon as you have a video rental market, 
you can tell there's some of them where they kind of realize this isn't going to make that much money in theaters, but they're hoping to make most of the money back on video rentals. Okay. I would definitely put this movie in that category. Yeah, I wonder what the box office was for this. All right, keep talking. I'm going to look that up. Yeah, the other one is just like how much against type John Cusack is playing in here, which we mentioned a few times when we were talking over the movie. Oh, that's true. Sorry, I was looking up. Oh, wait, that one didn't make any money. Oh, that was it. Oh, well, let's see. Okay, let's see. I'm, I am now looking at the Wikipedia page for it. Uh, budget, $3 million. Box office, 343766 So, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it definitely... probably got like a token release in Los Angeles and New York or something. And then it just went straight to video because they knew that's where the money was. Uh-huh. Um, there's quite a few movies like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. The period is pretty short. <gasps> you know how they make the joke about Jello Biafra? Mm -hmm. Jello Biafra was the FBI agent. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Okay, um, that, that's pretty funny. Yeah. Oh, and, and Fishbone did the score for it. I mean, there's all sorts of songs, um, especially in the music videos, but the, the rest of the music was, uh, was Fishbone. Yeah, and, and there's, I mean, there's a lot of big names that were associated with, like, Ma Michael Nesmith produced it, which makes sense, because this felt, this felt a lot like that, that Michael Nesmith, like, music video compilation that we reviewed uh -huh. many episodes ago when we had Kevin on, uh, the uh, Elephant Parts. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's like yes. half sketch comedy, half music video kind of stuff. Yeah, so you could see the connection. And uh, Jessica Walter shows up for a total of 10 seconds. And who's Jessica but Walter? Jessica Walter is uh, Lucille Bluth. In uh, uh, um, Arrested Development. And she's yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, Archer's mother on Archer. I forget what the name is. but oh, um, I didn't and, and she just passed away a year or two ago. Oh, oh that's sad. At the age of 80. Um, okay. Okay, here, Wikipedia has a list of, of a bunch of uh, famous people that were in it, made appearances. Uh, Mary Crosby, Clue Gulliger. Um, of course, we have, as you mentioned, Junior Walker and Sam Moore, who played uh, Swanky Mode. Uh, Lyle Alzado, or Alzado, Connie Stevens, Don Cornelius, Cor Courtney Love. Wow. Um, Courtney Love was in quite a few movies before whole like I, I watched one with megan a few weeks ago called straight to hell uh -huh. that movie is awful don't watch it but you got joe strummer and courtney love is kind of the the femme fatale it's okay. like a neo-western it's terrible um, um other people that were in it uh were um stiv baiters ted nugent was in it i missed that oh. uh you mentioned weird al um dougie fresh and and Doing the Roscoe's uh, waff, uh, chicken and waffles uh, commercials was King Cotton. Uh, so anyways, uh, I mean, I'll be honest, some of these names don't mean anything to me. A lot of these names, I mean, they probably would have been like fun Easter eggs in the 80s, but I think a lot of these people have passed out of the public memory. Oh, okay. One of the jokes was that one of the RV TV VJs was Martha Quinn, who was an MTV VJ. Okay. So they actually, so they had a, they had an MTV fixture parodying MTV. I mean, it, hmm. yeah. So anyways, oh, Bobcat Goldthwait was in it? No. Wait, for real? No. Yeah. Bobcat Goldthwait was in it. He played a, I totally missed that. Credited as Jack Cheese playing Don Druzel. I don't remember seeing him. Huh. He must have been in the background or something. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people show up for just a very brief moment. Um, and, and that's like a kind of common thing in a lot of like music themed movies of the 80s is that you could get because like musicians aren't getting a lot of phone calls to do movies, generally speaking. Right, right. So if you want a bunch of them in your movie, you can probably get a bunch of them. Um, and that's like straight to hell is totally that there's a few of those like no wave movies that nobody watches anymore because they all are kind of terrible, but they're, they're like filled with music, like the stuff that John Worry was in, in the late seventies. Um, I caught a few of them in a retrospective at MoMA and they were basically unwatchable. <laughs> um, hey, Dan. yeah, there's a lot of cameos, huh? One more cameo. Last one. All right. 
You remember the bottled water delivery man that we see for about 30 seconds mm -hmm. for just for, for one gag? That was Michael Nesmith. Oh, shit. Totally missed that. That's so. I, yeah. I, I mean, and he was just standing still on screen for 30 seconds, <laughs> um, maybe longer. So, yeah, totally missed that, too. So, um, so we, we got to talk about John Cusack's mustache. All right, let's do that. Uh, you, you, you want to start? Sure. It was this pencil thin mustache, and he also had slick back hair, made him look really skeezy. Uh, it was very similar to John Waters' uh, um, look, uh, but John Waters wants to look skeezy, so that, you know, normally, so that works. Also reminded me a little bit of, um, um, well, I keep saying Errol Flynn when I mean, jeez. Uh, There's Red a little Bunker. bit of Clark Gable. Clark Gable. Clark There's Clay a little bit of Clark Gable. The thing I, I was saying was like Fredo and the Godfather, except for like with without the hair loss. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and that goes back to tying uh uh there, there it came around our discussion of uh of the mob as uh capitalists. <laughs> so there we go. Uh uh John Cusack is uh is Fredo. Yeah, and, and his mustache in this movie, because like in 80s movies, he's usually playing like this sort of dorky, like underdog underdog, relatable, nice guy kind of thing, right? Like in the sure thing or and better say off, anything or in, better, uh, off dead. better off dead he's in one crazy summer right or is it everyone else except for him i want to say he was in that i never saw that one but oh okay but that was like his thing back then and then to see him kind of playing this uh like super skeezy music executive guy was kind of funny he does a pretty good job with it like he seems pretty questionable for most of the movie John Cusack. Yeah. Oh, and he was in One Crazy Summer. He's in the star of it. Opposite Demi Moore. Mm. Um, but yeah, 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 that mustache, that that look, but that mustache especially, that pencil thin mustache was really, really, really skeezy. Skeezy or skeevy? Maybe I think both. both. Yeah, yeah, I think both. either one works. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I also thought he looked like he would fit in, uh, in a, at a great Gatsby party. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. That, that was like the last time. I, honestly, that look is kind of like mustaches have come back a little bit. Yeah. As like ironic nods to 80s culture, mostly, I think. Like, like there's a lot of people I've met in the last few years. Well, not the last few years with COVID, because I haven't met many people in the last few years with COVID, but like... uh um, and I have COVID? Sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah. Ron, Ron has COVID. We, we can do like a COVID special. This is um, the COVID special. This is the COVID special. Yeah. Um, That's yeah, what like happened. The mustache is in, in like mullets. Mullets came back in a big way. Yeah. I used to have a mullet. You've seen my mullet picture, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a mullet and, you know, a business in the front party in the back. Uh, a hockey player uh, look. Even though I wasn't, uh, didn't really do sports. Well, I did. Now, now all the kids are trying to be Ron. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was ahead of the game then. Uh, no, I was. I guess I was a follower then. You know how I ended up with that mullet? My hair cut. No, used to. My hair used to be like fairly. Um, well, not really short, but just I don't know. Um, fairly clean cut. Um, and then there was one day. This is when I lived in a Seattle suburb, Mercer Island. And there was a really, really bad storm. And I had a haircut appointment at a place. I don't know. Usually we would go to Supercuts. I don't know why my mom made me an appointment at an actual hair salon. Um, and it was really storming. And that's important. Because when I went there, the storm was so bad that uh, the person who was supposed to cut my hair didn't want to cross the bridge because it was Mercer Island was actually an island. So she didn't. it, it wasn't considered that safe to drive on the bridge. It was I-90 all the way on the western side. Um, so there was somebody else there, um, some guy who cut my hair and he was telling me he was talking and all that and, and like very flamboyant and he was certainly gay. And he's the first person I met who was like, um, pretty, like, obviously gay. How's that? You know, that I actually like had a long conversation out and him. proud, out and proud. Um, and he said that he said something like, yeah, he's, you know, he's replacing this other person. You know, he's usually charges more because he's like some, oh, like some 
famous like hair hairstylists know that, but they're gonna charge me the amount that they would because oh, yeah, I got that <laughs> shtick before, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, wow. And he told me, you know, your hair would re- look really good if you if you if you grew it out. Um, and so I'm this queer kid in the closet. So one, I'm excited that like, oh my God, gay guy. Um, and two, you know, this expert is telling me I should grow my hair out. So that's when I started growing my hair longer. Um, or I thought about it for a little while and then I started growing it out. Um, so by um, in high school, I had longer hair and in college, I definitely did. I mean, it only went down to my shoulders or just above my shoulders. I can make a little tiny uh, braid. Um, but anyways, yeah, I remember, I remember the time I, I got that that kind of shtick was like, was it I was at Desperate Annie's. The guy gave me his card. He was he was just like, we can do something better with your hair, which at that point, probably yes. Mm. I, I was receptive. And so I show up, he's in he's in this like like dingy kind of indoor strip mall thing. Uh-huh. He he's not getting any business, I don't think. And I think this is the last time I got an actual like legit haircut because most of the time now I just cut my own hair because it all it always comes out the same anyway. Uh-huh. And I come out looking, and he's giving me the whole spiel about like I went to the the most the most prestigious hair cutting academy in Paris. You know, I I I have been to the haircut equivalent of your Harvard. You know, that's kind of stuff <laughs> all the time I get the haircut. And I come out, my hair, it looks like I'm a fucking French poodle. Like, it's in these little curly Q, like, cinnamon bun, whatever the fuck's on my uh, head. Eh. It was the worst my hair ever looked in my life, or maybe that just wasn't the way I physically identify myself. I don't know, maybe. Nobody else liked the haircut, though. It wasn't like, I wasn't getting compliments on this hair. Everybody was just sort of like, you know, was it raining outside and I missed it? Eh. Like You have pictures? Uh, no, I think it was only for like a day or two that I had it. Oh, okay. Would you ever uh, do it again? Not with him, but in in general, would you ever fancy uh, haircut? Yeah, or at least, or at least, would you ever go back to a hairstylist or a barber and I mean, get, get a professional cut, super cuts? If I wanted to go, if I if I wanted to go to a barber at this point, because like I do a pretty decent job on my own hair, I think like it comes out pretty even. It would have to be because the environment in the barber shop was fun oh okay like the appeal of barber shops in my head you know i never like there wasn't like barber shop culture in saratoga new york yeah but like the idea of like you go into the barber shop and it's just sort of like the place where everybody's going in to like do bullshit like i want a barber shop who's like moonlighting as a bookie Hmm. that's that's where i would want to get a haircut it would be for the social element not for my the sake of my hair you you want a barbershop like in the movie barbershop basically yeah and there's the you there's only one thing keeping you from doing that you're not black sorry dan that's a black thing <laughs> it happens yeah i, I, mean, I, I don't, well no no i guess i guess so so well, black when, when and, i was in brooklyn i did go into a black barber shop and get a haircut and i think the guys were surprised that i wanted a haircut because they were definitely running like numbers out of the back of that place oh no so it took like an hour and a half to get the haircut because uh-huh. they didn't have they there were like three guys working there and none of them did haircuts and it, it, i'm not telling you this wasn't a big place this was just like a it was like the size of a small restaurant maybe hmm. There were maybe eight chairs in the whole place. Uh, And I just remember, because I didn't understand what was going on at the time because I was in college. I was just like, wow, like, why is there no one here who cuts hair? This is a barber shop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, So does that mean you didn't get the full barber shop experience that you were uh, going for? Or did you you get a conversation and stuff? I got some conversation. Like, I overheard a lot of conversations about basketball games and then a lot of stuff about uh like odds and like people owing people money okay well that makes sense if they were running numbers in the back yeah so i i think that that was uh i mean it was an experience and it wasn't it was a cheap enough haircut i think it was like 12 14 bucks oh that's cheap for a haircut yeah i mean that's the most i've ever paid for i I think i paid like 25 bucks for the french poodle haircut (laughs) But Wait, how did it, so? How was the haircut from this place? It was decent, you know. I just told them like 
usually I go in those places, they, they, they're like, well, usually, I mean, I, I've been to a barber maybe like once or twice in the last 10 years, but uh, they always ask like, what style do you want? And I don't know the name of the fucking haircuts. I don't know anything about haircuts. Yeah. Like you're the, you're the professional. You know what I do? Mm-hmm. So when I went to a genie, I mean, I mentioned before, well, she's no longer there, but Jeannie at Floyd's in Cambridge, shout out to Floyd's 99. Um, she, uh, she asked me, you know, I always say maybe this or this kind of that. And she was like, you know what, next time, bring me a picture of what you want. Mm-hmm. So the next time I came back and I brought 10 pictures, none of them looked alike at all. And she looked at them and was like, these are very different. It's like, yeah, I know, but maybe somewhere in there, there's a feel, you know, so she's like, all right, I'll figure it out. The next time, do you know what I brought her? I brought her a picture of Cary Grant in Bringing Up Baby. And I look nothing <laughs> like Cary Grant. And my hair is nothing like Cary Grant's. But I wanted something that evoked that particular image. It's his hair is wet. It's after he, mm. he fell into the water. Um, or or um, uh, Catherine Hepburn you know, pulled him into the water, you know, trying to get out or something like that. So uh, she actually did a good job of getting, she got exactly what I wanted. And that's pretty much the haircut. That's what I've been doing. So, well, after that, I took a picture of what I looked like, like Mm. my actual hair with that cut that I like. And that's what I've used since that I show people. Jeannie's no longer there. I now now go to Tiffany. Tiffany did a great job. Um, Slight adjustment. She actually, there was one haircut that I got, I've talked about that looked awful and looked like a neo-Nazi. Um, I finally got it to grow out enough and she fixed it and got it to go exactly the way I like it. A little mm. bit different than Jeannie's, but I really like it. Um, I also, unfortunately, I might have infected Tiffany with COVID um, because uh, I got my hair cut on Wednesday and found out that I have COVID on Thursday. Um, and I think I contracted it the Friday beforehand when I went to, well, I won't say where I got it um, um, to protect the innocent. Half so, so I guess the moral here is cut your own hair. Yeah, no, well, oh, yes, because this way you protect people. Right, right. That was the worst part. I the whole time during the you know, the, the whole time of the pandemic, the thing that I was most worried about was not contracting it and getting sick. I mean, I was worried about that, but even more so was contracting it and then get infecting somebody else and then them getting sick. Oh. So that was the thing that um and uh that's my punishment for treating a pandemic like uh like it was endemic um well, anyways so yeah no i horrify i i i was i'm a little worried that i got tiffany sick and that i also got um thursday morning i went to see my therapist in person for the first first time since early december um and i discovered around noon that i had covid and you know i emailed and called her immediately but so that's two people that i infected and of course if tiffany got it she, she would have infected others because she didn't she would have had to have a higher viral load mm-hmm. um, with my therapist she wouldn't have, she might have contracted it which i'm worried about um but also it's an enclosed space right mm-hmm. so everybody that's coming in afterwards is breathing the covid air that i was breathing out so so uh, yeah i'm worried about all these people that might have infected pandemic at tiffany's <laughs> audrey hepburn I, I i was gonna say that like when i used to go in for haircuts and they would ask me that question i never had pictures of haircut i never had a specific haircut i wanted so i didn't even have an answer to the question so i would usually like i think i've literally said this to multiple barbers i just want to leave here with less hair than i walked in with <laughs> all right well that's a that's a that's that's simple enough well, I used to tell I used to tell the hairstylist, you know, a little shorter here and there, and then the rest, you know, you're the expert, you figure it out. Now I say I know what I want. I mean, so my haircut was never radically different, except for a little while where I tried to grow. I ended up with sort of a, an emo haircut, um, and the mistake when when I ended up with a Nazi haircut. Um, oh well, and then there was a time where I showed a picture of the Nazi haircut to the hairstylist and said, "Don't do this." I want this. I showed the pictures of what I want, and then I showed him what not to do. So, of course, he did what I told him not to do. Um, but uh, other than those two times, uh, my haircut for the last like 25 years has been wait, 30. Now I just want to walk in with like a fucking picture of Gary Shandling and say, Will this haircut make my ass look fat? <laughs> hey, you're stealing his joke. It's, 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 a- it's- 
It's not it's Stephen. A, in it's memoriam. Alive. It's a way. It's it's in memoriam. It's in memoriam. In Keeping memoriam. the flame yeah. alive. Yeah. <laughs> but we're well, we're approaching four thirty. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I know you that. said you had to be somewhere. Yeah, I'm waiting to hear of when I haven't heard yet. Of uh, I'm waiting okay. for, uh, um, for someone to contact me. So uh, I guess it'll be a little after four thirty. But okay. yeah, but it's a it's a good time to say so. Tape heads. So tape heads. So I guess do you have any final thoughts about this movie? Um, yeah, I enjoyed it. That's yeah. that's about it. Like I said, it was you know it was it, it was it was fun. Um, yeah, it's it's not going to win any awards. No, and it didn't really I, have. I message. predict, you know, going into award season, tape heads isn't going to get anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, it wasn't nominated this year for either the no. either the Academy Awards or the Razzies. So, um, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it exists. You yeah. can you can find it on the internet if you're willing to look a little bit. Yeah, you know but what I think? Mm-hmm. Actually, it has a very important place in film history. You know what that is? It gave us the phrase uh, spectral nostalgia. Right, right. Because I don't even think it invented the word tape head. Because I use the word tape head all the time. Oh, really? Because I'm dealing with the uh, audio cassette collectors online mm. a lot. So, like a lot well, of those the- forums, they'll just be called tape heads, some variation of tape heads. Oh, interesting. Well, I mean, in this case, it was videotape. It was referring to that kind of tape. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a. Uh, it's a pun as well because it means like you've got tapes on the brain, but also the head is the thing that reads the tape on either a VCR oh, or a cassette deck. Oh, I didn't catch that. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And uh, yeah, so it made me think of this movie. I'll probably never think of this movie again. I have now seen this twice. Well, the next time you visit Carrie, you'll probably see the the videotape prominently displayed as you walk in. Right, <laughs> like tapes. Well, have that, that little halo of white around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't exactly. seem to be coming from anywhere. <laughs> um, but you know, after this, uh, we need to go onto Urban Dictionary and and add spectral nostalgia and see what happens. Hey, that's what happened with the nominee. I put that on there more than ten years ago, and it's got you know. Up. It's got more upvotes than downvotes. It doesn't have many of either, but it's got more up than down. You know what the moral of this movie is? What's the moral of this movie? So if you're listening to this and you're a hot lady with a shotgun that's willing to offer me free red, hit like, subscribe, (laughs) leave one in the comments section. I will definitely get back to you. Um, If Ron gets back to you, it's an error. Um, (laughs) Yeah, if I get back to you, I'll, I'll I'll put in there that this is me, and I'll say, "Hey, Dan, <laughs> you say hi." That lady showed up. <laughs> you you've been you've been waiting for uh, some lady with a shotgun. Yeah. Um. So. All right. So yeah. So so to all of you, uh, ladies or otherwise, shotguns, no shotguns. Until next time, this is Dan, and this is Ron, and. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll see you next week when we cover the classic film COVID at Tiffany's. <laughs> um, well, I'd say t- you know take care, everyone, and uh, do your best not to contract this. Yeah, don't let pandemic. Ryan breathe on you. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, the next yeah. Week I, or hope, two. I I hope you're wearing your mask while you're listening to this episode. <laughs> And I will say, I know, you know, we were laughing about this and the fact that I have COVID. It is actually a potentially deadly disease. We are in a pandemic. Um, please take precautions. Um, I do feel I've actually been taking a lot of precautions. Um, I've been very, very careful for most of it. And I started letting my guard down in the last uh, month or so, and especially in the last uh, week and a half. And, I, uh, you know, um, I paid for it. So, uh, hey, the first two years... I made it through. So yeah, I don't recommend this to anyone. Um, My symptoms have not been very severe. Thank goodness. Um, But- uh, How many buckets of popcorn do you give it? Um, I I give it a kernel. Okay. I give it, you know how at the movie theater, you've got the, all the popcorn and stuff. And then there's the metal shelf underneath that all the kernels and all the burnt stuff falls through. That's what I give it. Okay. So it's, it's still, it's not quite, because I think the lowest rating is like, popcorn bucket with a hole cut out of the bottom well depends on who you are 
<laughs> and on that note, yeah, take care, everyone. Yeah, when you get back and call me. <laughs> All right. Bye.